On today's podcast, we have Brad Dot, and I've been really excited for this podcast for a while. Brad recently took a trip down to Costa Rica to try ayahuasca for four days. Why is that important? A lot of people have done ayahuasca. Well, it's important to me because Brad was a member of the Utah House of Representatives for a lot of years, and so I wanted his state slash legal perspective on ayahuasca and psychedelics. Also, Brad is currently serving as a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I wanted his religious perspective on this. And he's one of the only people I know that could come and provide a perspective from religious point of view, but also a state and legislative point of view. Also, in my personal life, I have so many people that are close to me that have been using psychedelics to overcome porn, sexual trauma, anxiety, depression, relationship obstacles, PTSD, and just trying to become a better person in general. And although I've never tried any psychedelic or been involved with it in any way, it's been a topic that's been really fascinating to me. I just finished my third book on this, and my personal view on it is I think it's a lot more feared than it is dangerous, and I've seen it do a lot of good. And so I wanted to have Brad come on and talk about it from his perspective. He was also part of legalizing marijuana in the state of Utah, not for recreational use, but specifically medical use. Um, and one last dis- disclaimer I'll say about Brad is he's not on the podcast representing the state of Utah or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're just talking about his experience and his personal views and takes on psychedelics and specifically ayahuasca. So with that, let's jump into it. Brad, thanks for coming on. Boy, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. For me, this is just a really cool opportunity because I'm part of this mastermind and there's there's a bunch of people in this group that have been struggling with porn addiction, sexual trauma, anxiety, depression, relationship issues, PTSD, whatever. And they've all approached this subject of whether you want to call it psychedelics, plant medicine, whatever, but they've all approached it with a lot of respect. They've all done it under guidance and with the intent to go figure out this obstacle. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the room with these, these people sharing their story and how they've completely changed and overcame things and, and resolved matters and progressed in their relationship and all these things. And it's, I've gone from one end to the other on how I viewed these things. And I think in life, there's been topics that have came up that have bad stigmas around them that were miscategorized. And for me, I've been down this journey of, I just finished my third book on it. I've, you know, talked to countless people and I've just completely changed my, my view on it. And I think others will, will see that same thing if they educate themselves on this topic too. I agree. And also a big part of our people that work for us, um, mental health is such a big thing. And when you do sales and especially door to door sales, everything is just magnified and it's a very tough mental and emotional job. And so you have to be extremely mentally healthy to do that. And so seeing you go through your journey to educate yourself on it and participate in it, I wanted to pick your brain and have you just share your your story. Oh, thank you. You know, and you're absolutely right. And I just, if I could just expand on what you said there a little bit, I mean, we see so many people with mental health issues and, and it's escalating we, we don't have enough therapists to, to cover it all. Totally. And the tools they have are not great. They're just not. Um, and, and so that's why we need to look at this. So anyway, I came to this uh, as a former legislator and current lobbyist. I mean, not all lobbyists are bad, just <laughs> 95% of them. So anyway, I came to this as that. And the, the, the company I was lobbying for, which is for a hemp product, um, they called me up and says, hey, I've got a friend who is, is uh, she's done psychedelics, but she's very, very nervous about becoming public about it because she didn't want to be judged and she didn't want to put her, her uh, church membership in jeopardy and sure. all those kinds of things. And, yeah. and, and, and at that time, I didn't know anything about psychedelics except that there was LSD and there was magic mushrooms and that was it. And, and you didn't do them unless you're part of the counterculture. That's all I knew. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Nothing else. I mean, the idea of using psychedelics for mental health had never even crossed my path. Totally. I think most people, when they hear those words, they think hippies, 70s, yeah. crazy, like 
whatever. Timothy Lear, to, to an in drop out, you know, whatever yeah. it is, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Anyway, so I said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll meet. And so I met her, and we had a, a great lunch. And by the end of it, I mean, very sincere, very real person. Uh, she's probably okay. It's Brittany. Ferdner's her name. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, she's kind of get out in the public. So, in fact, she did. She's the one who did that uh, uh, Instagram feed that you saw, which is how I heard about you. Is from that. There so you go. I'm grateful for that. Yeah, yeah, and wonderful, wonderful woman. I mean, just uh, just really classy and and listening to her as a very active, committed member of, of the church. Yeah, um, have that experience and, and her real concern was not wanting to get sideways with the church. Yeah. And so, and, and I think a lot of people have that same concern. Absolutely, right? and, and I understand because yeah. it's 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 new territory. It's new, and and it's been stigmatized to the point where I mean, obviously, if you're going to go out and use this stuff recreationally, and that becomes kind of your form sure. of worship, yeah, yeah, the church should have a problem with that. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. So, uh, the first thing I did is, well, let's. Uh, this is news to me, but let's let's get in front of uh, uh, the church lobbyist, the person who would kind of. Uh, give some indication of the church's stance, and so we uh, we connected and, and essentially, and you understand that this is kind of a policy subject to change at any time. Sure, but the the feeling we got from the lobbyist was if it's legal and it's well researched and there's scientific data to back it up and it's and it's delivered in a medically appropriate way. Yeah, we won't have a problem with it. Sure, and so she felt a lot more comfortable with that. And in the meantime, I started doing some research on it because I was really curious. I mean, this is a whole new field, right? And what I got back was amazing. There's this big research study being done at Johns Hopkins on psilocybin. That's magic mushrooms. Yeah. At, with phenomenal results. There's this very long podcast by Jordan Peterson, who I'm a big fan of. Same. Um, great guy, isn't he? I mean, just love Incredibly. the guy. And he came to Salt Lake not too long ago, oh, a couple yeah. months ago. I mean, just the guy, I want to shake his hand and tell him thank you. you yeah. Know, for just great stuff. Anyway, he did a long podcast with the guy doing the research in Johns Hopkins. And, and so I listened to all of that and everything, and it was just amazing to me. And, and then this group said, hey, we're going to go to a, a place called Rhythmia, which is a place in Costa Rica that does uh, ayahuasca. That's another psychedelic made from a, a leaf and a vine combined together. And they said, do you want to go? And I said, no. <laughs> Why would I want to go? I mean, sure. it, and, but then they, they said, listen, you know, we'll, we'll pay for it. It's all good. And, and uh, you, you can decide. And, and so after, over, let's just say over the course of a couple of months, I got to the place where it says, you know, I, I need to go do this. I need to see what this is all about. And, and I don't want to read about it. I don't want to uh, hear it from somebody else. I want to experience this firsthand. Every, every bit of research that I saw said that it, at worst case is these psychedelics have no real long-term effects. And you're not going to come out of there any worse off than going in there. And a lot of yeah. very positive effects. Yeah. And so I went to uh, Rhythmia and had an amazing experience there. So, How long ago was that? Uh, it was about a month ago. Okay, cool. So it's yeah. pretty recent. Very recent, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you all about it down there. So first day we did breath work, just, just breathing, and that actually was more profound than I would have realized. And then the next four nights we did ayahuasca. Now, if you haven't done ayahuasca, it's pretty intense. And and it uh, it's not something you want to do casually because it causes your body to, uh, well, let's just say you get you get the runs, you get you throw up, all that kind of stuff. It's very intense. It's not a pleasant, fun experience. It, it's, not a, it's not something I would recommend if you're going to do it for fun. Yeah. So anyway, first two nights, a couple things happened. I, I did get the... The, the the runs I didn't get it I didn't throw up but I was next to two people who I mean they really were throwing up hard and you know when you hear that sound it it's kind of jarring yeah and so those first two nights were they weren't great for me and you know you're in there for about three or four hours or four or five and then they turn the lights on and then and then you share you have kind of the sharing time and by the time the lights came on I was like oh gosh I just want to be done I am out of here and then and then they're sharing and i'm just laying there on my on my mattress saying please i just want to go home and go to bed and and i didn't want to interfere with anybody else they were all having great experiences but for me it's like Ugh. 
And I, I, and I saw my friends were having these amazing experiences. You know, they were, they were seeing things, they were resolving traumas. Uh, they were, uh, you know, seeing past uh, histories that would help them to, re, you know, adjust to it. There was one guy who went down there, an atheist. He came back a firm believer in God. He said, I can't not believe in God after what happened. Um, anyway. I was reading a study on that in one of the books that I just finished in. They had over 5,000 participants, and every single one came out believing in a higher power. Yeah. And what I loved about this book is it just had so much data tables around all the experiences. Is it addictive? Mm-hmm. Does it leave you with depression, anxiety in any way? Um, do you believe in a higher power? And just to be able to look at all the data, I mean, pretty conclusively, it, it could look like this is not addictive. Mm-mm. And if you go in with the right intent, it looks like it's improving people's lives. It, it seems like pretty consistent that way. I mean, it, worst case is nobody comes out any worse. And, yeah. and most of the time, if not all the time, they come out better. And so, and, and if I had left after that second night, I would have said, well, I didn't come out any worse off. Then that third night, my friends kind of gathered around me, and they said, listen, you need to have a stronger intention. Uh, you need to you know, push yourself a little bit more. And so I did. And that third night, I, I, I took the third cup. Usually I, I was only taking two. That third night, yeah. I, t- I took the third cup. And, and uh, you know, sure enough, about a half after I took it, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds kind of awful, but it was really ended up being very, very special. I I, I walked to the to the bathroom to take care of business, and while I was in there taking care of business, I had this huge wave of nausea. So I'm I, I'm sitting there on the potty, facing a bucket, you know, just going for it. And yeah. I get done and I, I clean up and I go back to my mattress, and the shamans come and they, uh, you know, they, they perform a little ceremony for you, and then a couple things happen. First of all, I just begin to feel good, just this sense of peace and and connectedness, and and just really affection for everybody that was there. And then the, the music came up. They have music during the ceremony to kind of help guide the experience. And um, they had this song of joy, and, and people were dancing and, and just having a good time. And, and I didn't want to dance because that would be happy for nobody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm happy to watch dancing. Um, but they were they were dancing, and then it was the most bizarre thing. I don't even know if I can relate it properly, but there were people who were purging, throwing up in time with the music. Wow. And wow. I, I know it sounds crazy, but yeah. for me it was like, okay, I get it now. It's not jarring. It's a part of the process. And I laid back on my mattress, and I just felt this profound, deep sense of peace. And, and just like everything was right. I mean, just really intense. And uh, I got up and went out to the fire that they keep outside the uh, the, the room. And and uh, they say when you go to the fire, you're supposed to introduce yourself. So you, you, you say your full name, and then your mother's full name, and then your father's full name. And my father had passed away about 20 years ago, and great, great guy. I mean, as fathers go, he's he's the best there was. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I so I said his name, and it... it it, it brought some real emotion. I mean, just longing and loving, and and I, and it, it made me feel for the the folks in there because so many of them in there, their experiences stem from having a lousy father, who was abusive, neglectful, whatever, and and that's what they needed to heal. And I'm thinking, I just wish I could, I wish I could give you my dad yeah. for a while. You know, wow. just just you know, that's just the love you feel. And then I I went back in and laid down and had some more experiences and. And, and felt some forgiveness for some, some past wrongs and that sort of thing. And then and then all of a sudden the night was over. I, I mean it was it just passed like that. This is and the fourth night? It's the third night. Third night, okay. And and came time to share. My hand goes up first. Here I am and I share and and just saying how great this was and what a positive experience I had and then uh, so it was good. And then the fourth night was it was different but the same kind of a thing where they had a different brew that fourth night because it was more it was stronger. I had one sip and that's all I needed. I mean, I was I, I was doing everything and I was uncomfortable for a long time, and and then it it stopped, and I, I participated in what they call a healing ceremony. I went back to my mattress and just fell asleep. I mean, I was all of a sudden it was morning. And I, I, I understand that when you have that kind of experience, there's actually some healing going on 
even when you're not conscious. And and to be unconscious in that kind of a noisy thing, there has to be something kind of driving that. So yeah. anyway, that, that night was also very short as far as my experience goes. The sharing was very positive. And, you know, and, and those people I went down with, we were friends before, but we're – we're really, really tight. Now. Now. You, you just feel this this love, this connection, this protectiveness, wanting them to be happy. And so, you know, I, I come back thinking, you know, there's a lot of healing that happened there. And so, it's very positive. Yes. Some of the questions that I've got is, what does it look like specifically the whole process? So you go to a place. Mm -hmm. you, are you in a circle? Are you in different rooms? We were in one big room. Okay. Everybody had their own mattress, pillow, and blanket, and and bucket okay <laughs> and your own shot glass okay and uh you know you have kind of a little bit of warm-up they kind of talk through a little bit help yeah. you get your intentions and then you all line up and get your first uh, drink of the tea it's a brew and you go back and lay down and they've got music playing and and then uh, you lay there and process it for about an hour and then they have you take your second cup usually and most everybody does that and then you go back and lay down and after that it's kind of like up to you if you want more cups or not. Like I sure. said, third night I did, there's some people who are powering down like five cups, and I'm like, that scares me to even think about it. But, and then, you know, during the course of the night, they're playing music. They have uh, the shamans there watching you to, to make sure that you're not in distress. They have medical personnel, which they needed. There was somebody uh, in front of me. She'd locked her knees standing. It had nothing to do with the ayahuasca. She'd locked her knees with a standard flow and just kind of just phew, passed out. Passed out, which... Yeah. Like I say, nothing to do with I've psychedelic. Seen do that before, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, but so you know, through it all, you're you're very very closely monitored. You're guided, and uh, and the one thing, the one rule they have is you. They call it the noble silence, and and what that means is don't interact with the other people. Let them have their experience. You have yours. Interact with the shamans. Now, I kind of broke that with my friends, and I don't think they care too much about that but you don't want to interact with somebody who's kind of going through their own process yeah so but that's what it was but it was very guided very supervised in fact one of the guys in our group they wouldn't even let him take it because he had kind of a heart rhythmia okay so they're very careful about who takes it one of the other questions i've got is being if someone's a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints mm -hmm. and they're going into this and I'm guessing you probably went into it with a similar view of how do I strengthen my faith in God or how do I strengthen mm -hmm. my faith in different aspects of their religion? What was your experience? Did it strengthen you in any way? Yes, it did. In fact, uh, I will say this. The last two nights, the, you have one night of breath work and then four nights of ayahuasca and then two more nights of breath work. Okay. And the breath work after the ayahuasca was far more intense and that last night of breath work, just breathing. That's yeah, it. Yeah, just breathing. And you're breathing. You, you kind of have the, You kind of hyperventilate for a half hour, and then and then you hold your breath. And it's scary how long you can hold your breath. And during that, my intention was, I just want to to feel God's presence. That was it. And so we we, we were breathing. Then they say, hold your breath, and I'm holding my breath and have my eyes closed and. And in the back of my mind, I said, why are, why are the lights on? They, why do they turn the lights on? Because, you know, it's, it's, in the, it's in the evening. It's getting dark. And usually they, they leave the lights off to kind of make it more conducive. I said, the lights are on. And then I opened my eyes, and the lights weren't on. Wow. So I just had this feeling of light, again, just from breathing. And, and, and I felt that was my answer. You know, God is there. I, have, I feel God's presence. And the fact is, is... Uh, they may use different terms, but I just translate them into my terms for my faith. And uh, when I see the, the good that was happening there, I'm convinced, me personally, that it did bring me uh, closer to God. It did. Uh, it was a very positive experience, and it did create some bonds and connections that I think will be very lasting. Yeah. So that, to me, is what religion is supposed to do. Totally. Maybe hearing about the atheist that you said that came mm -hmm. in and left with a, a different view, were you able to talk with him afterwards very much and understand what it was he experienced to change his mind? Yeah, he uh, he said he he felt like he talked to God. During, wow. He felt like he had a an experience with with God, and 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 he said, "I can't I can't be an atheist anymore. I just can't do it." 
and and he's actually changed other aspects of his life to line up with that. And and this is a guy who, I mean, brilliant guy, good guy. He's made some tough choices, which he's not shy about telling you about. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, he he was already doing good. Now he wants to do even better. And it's really neat to to see that transformation. You said a quote that I hadn't heard before that I really liked before as we were just talking. You said, Mm -hmm. anything that brings healing is part of my religion. And I just thought that was really beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's actually, uh, and it's funny because it was stated by Brigham Young, and then it was repeated by Dallin H. Oaks. And and what it was was, uh, I'll try to give it as best I can, and I can find the the conference talk where it's at, but... uh, what it was is people went to Brigham Young and said, well, can we have a blessing? And Brigham, Brigham Young would ask them, well, have you, have you taken advantage of all the remedies available? And they would say no. And he said, well, that doesn't comport with my religion. Mm. He said, in addition to the, the priesthood blessing, which he encouraged, he said, you should be taking advantage of all remedies that are available that are good and positive. Totally. And that's my religion is we do everything we can on our own, we couple that with the power of the priesthood, sure, and and it all works together. Yeah, I think that's a a good thing to bring up because as I was doing my research on, you know, how, why should you consider maybe doing something like this? And so I'm looking at all the things that it treats: alcohol, alcoholism, excuse me, anxiety, depression, trauma, addiction, OCD, eating disorders, PTSD. There's a study I read where they administered to cancer patients who were on their deathbed Mm -hmm. and throughout the process, they lost the fear of death. Mm. How beautiful is that for somebody like that? Exactly. And how could you not want them to experience that? And just reading through other psilocybin experiences and how um, this one study I read, maybe it was the John Hopkins one that you were referencing that I think it was actually that 78% of the people in that study said it was the most profound experience of their life. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at, you know, the birth of their child or getting married or different, very significant experiences. And so, but, and then you study the other side, why are people so frightened by this? And I think it's because that there really is more fear than how dangerous these things are, Mm -hmm. but it's the fear of the unknown is what I'm seeing. Oh, I agree. I mean, I didn't know about it. Yeah. And uh, everything I'd been told about it was, well, LSD have flashbacks that can almost kill you and yeah. on and on and on. And, uh, you know, it's like, but now I've seen people who've done it, who've experienced it. I've experienced it. And I'm not afraid of it anymore. Sure. And and I think that when we get past the stigma and start taking a, a look at the science, I mean, you think about it. This is the same kind of thing that happened with cannabis. I mean, marijuana, growing up, was was what the uh, the weirdos did behind the bar, the potheads, and yeah, just the all the stigma, right? Yeah, and and but now you see people who are using it responsibly, yeah, for a medical purpose, who are getting great benefit, sure, from it, and and I think this is the same thing. Uh, right now, for a lot of those conditions you mentioned, addiction, anxiety, depression, so forth. We don't really have great tools. We have some medication that kind of covers up some of the symptoms and lets you function. We, we have uh, uh, different things like that. But when you do a lot of these psychedelics, it doesn't cover up anything because you do it maybe once or twice in, in a series of sessions in a guided, medically appropriate way. And, and many of those people, which I think the study bears out, come off their medication. Uh, they, they, they have a different perspective on life and they're able to function perfectly normally. Which is what I believe medicine should do, truly, yeah. is heal you so that you don't need to always use it for forever. It fixes the causes, not yeah. cover the symptoms. Yes, and there's a lot of pills out there that will just numb, like you said, yeah. some of the symptoms, right? Yeah, I mean, opioids... I mean, look, I'm, I'm a health guy. I'm, I'm a fitness guy. Opioids... They mask the pain. They don't make the pain go away. You just don't feel it. Yeah. But, you know, the right kind of exercise, the right kind of, of stretching, all that kind of stuff, depending on the kind of pain, it can actually heal the pain. So you don't need the opioid anymore. That's where you want to get to. You're not taking these drugs constantly 
you're uh, you're doing something that actually helps tr- the trauma heal. Sure. I'm glad you brought up marijuana because that's that's where I wanted to go next. Is mm-hmm. I was sharing a, an experience in our family where I had a family member that had tried opioids and different things to uh, relieve or eliminate pain that just comes um, at, with aging. And one of the things I suggested was medicinal marijuana. And after hearing other really good results from other family members, friends, and and um, just the topic of bringing that up, how other family members viewed that suggestion, there was so much baggage around that word. Mm-hmm. And But I think you've seen this process, you've seen this come into legislation, get it approved from a medicinal standpoint. Mm -hmm. And now we are, I don't know how many years later, but to look back and say, there's absolutely use cases where it's, it's brought a a great experience to some people from a health perspective, right? Absolutely right. You know, you'll see people who, uh, their lives have changed. They can now function. They don't have pain anymore. They're able to live. Uh, Guy across the street from me, he takes a fairly high dose of uh, medical cannabis, and he has to because he's in a really bad way health-wise. I mean, just from uh, different things, diabetes and so forth, and this is the only thing that helps him to function. Because he could take opioids, but then he wouldn't he wouldn't be functional. Yeah. He, he'd be without pain, but he would be in, in a complete stupor. So the cannabis in proper dosage helps him to function, so yes, we're seeing some really amazing uses of it. So it makes you rethink things because from my perspective, I look at marijuana and like you said, how you viewed it growing up. Mm-hmm. I had those same exact thoughts, yeah. but now how I view it is completely different. And so what's weird for me is I looked at this thing that was illegal, that is now legal mm-hmm. and how much good it's done. I'm like, man, I have to rethink that. But then I look at the things that are legal, mm-hmm. opioids and alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't think I've changed at all on those. I think, you know, you look at alcohol, just for example, and there's 10,000 lives a year that are lost just from drunk driving. Mm -hmm. You look at domestic violence, and we were kind of talking about this before, and how how many times is domestic violence related to alcohol? Very consistently. Very consistently. And then you look at alcohol as a leading cause of traffic fatalities. Mm -hmm. And you look at brain impairment and all these things, but it's legal. Yeah, it's legal. But then we're going to sit here as a government and say this thing that is helping alcoholism, anxiety, depression, trauma, OCD, all these things. Mm -hmm. And that's illegal. And so what I see is massive inconsistencies. And I know you're part of the solution to helping solve that. Right. But it's just like... I think anybody can agree, no matter where you stood on COVID and the mask thing, there was massive inconsistencies, and I'm just seeing those same things take place in this space as well. Very mixed messages, very confused. Well, um, I mean, you know, to to really mess things up takes a government bureaucracy. (laughs) That's just the truth of it. Yeah. Yeah. Drugs are legalized or not legalized for a really interesting variety of reasons. Sure. Um, You're right. Alcohol has very few positive effects. Some people say it has some, but it's it's pretty hard to find. Pretty destructive in the data. I mean, it doesn't take very long to look at the data on that. Yeah, and tobacco, same thing. It's uh, you can't really find a positive use. Well, there's some people who say that, that using tobacco is a psychedelic. Yeah which is very different than, than smoking constantly. Sure. It may have some effect, but to, to use it the way people do with cigarettes, you can't point to a positive outcome sure. from it at all. Sure. And, and yet when we, it, it just seems so hard when we find the science that says if this plant or this ex- extract from plant is used properly, it has these, these huge benefits. And it's so amazing to me that it's so hard to work through that and, and get it to the point where people can really benefit from that. But that's that's what we got to do. I yeah. mean, that's really what it's all about. We have to realize, okay, we have to be willing to change our minds. Absolutely, because right now as it stands, it's considered a Schedule One drug, mm-hmm. which means you could get a Class A misdemeanor, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And what a Schedule One drug means is that there's no therapeutic benefit, there's no accepted medical use, and there's high abuse potential. You want to hear something funny? Yeah. Okay. Uh, What's one of the, uh, and you'll probably hit on it. Think of some really, really nasty drugs. 
that you would never want to start using. Go cocaine. Ahead. Okay, that's a bad one. Cocaine schedule two. Really? It's not a schedule one drug. Cocaine is legal to use. Really? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's not used very much, but it's a schedule two. Yeah. Because it, it actually is a pretty effective anesthetic in limited quantities. All right, what's another one? I think of heroin and meth. Meth. Meth is schedule two. Wow. Now, heroin's schedule one. Yeah. But meth is schedule two. Wow. It is legal to use. In fact, almost all of your um, uh, ADD medication, that's some form of meth. I, I mean, it's it's yeah. modified meth. Sure. But, and it has some positive benefit. But you know what I'm saying is yeah. drugs that you would never think of as anything but illegal are legal. Yeah. And, and yet here we have cannabis, which I'm not saying it's it's without downsides it has some yeah but to make it a schedule two just so we can do the research yeah and understand it and and administer it in medically appropriate ways what's the downside to that and sure. i can't find one sure yeah so that comes back to the inconsistencies yeah kind of changing gears and coming back to plant medicine is you went and obviously participated with ayahuasca yeah what about psilocybin or lsd or dmt or ketamine well, you know, I did one session of ketamine, which is legal yeah, in Utah, in the, US, yeah. in the U.S., and for me, it was kind of a dud. I mean, okay. just for me. I'm not, I've, I've seen people use ketamine and get great benefits from it, so no, uh, no aspersions on them. For sure. me, I, I did it. I, I had this dissociative experience. I came back, and, and after it was kind of like a big so what. Okay. So other people have done it, and it's helped in the process through things. As far as psilocybin, magic mushrooms go, uh, I, I've talked to dozens of people, and there's big studies out there showing that it's incredibly effective for depression and anxiety. Those are the studies that have been done. Sure. And, yeah. and so that's probably in Utah would be the first step would be psilocybin. It's very, very easy to produce. It's just mushrooms. You're saying to becoming legal? To becoming medically legal. Medically legal for medical legal. use, yeah. yeah. Which is what I meant, sorry. Yeah, you know, that's okay. Yeah. I just like, I'm, I'm, I'm picky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, legal for medical use. And, and so psilocybin, there's, there's more studies on that than there is on ayahuasca. Uh, and and uh, DMT is ayahuasca. Uh, MDMA is going to probably be legal federally before we could get to it in the state anyway. Okay. LSD, that's probably going to be a while just because that still has so much stigma around it. Yeah. And frankly, I want to dig in and study a little bit more myself, but I'm not going to rule it out out of hand. And then the other one is uh, MD, no, I said MDMA. There's Iboga, I think is the other one. Okay. That's another one that's probably in the future. But next year, most likely, if anything, there'll be a proposal to legalize psilocybin medically. And then the others maybe would follow suit after that. How impactful do you think it is being involved in our state government for you to go and, and try ayahuasca and then to come back and to be able to talk about that? Well, people seem to want to listen to me. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I speak the truth and I speak from my own experience. I mean, I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization, Sure. Yeah. but uh, I will tell you what I've learned and what I found out. And if I have any kind of reputation, hopefully that follows along. But do you feel like it gives you more credibility to talk with your peers in the political level of here's why I think we should legalize this from a medicinal standpoint? I think so. Yeah. I, I mean, I was the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee in the House. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's a position of trust. And I think I was put there because I understand a lot of these health care issues, not being a health care professional, sure. but having many, many, many interactions with the health care system. Um, I think it gives me some standing to speak credibly and honestly. Because you were issues. part of with hemp, marijuana yeah. coming in to the state of Utah, becoming legal from a medicinal standpoint. Right? Absolutely. You were very heavily involved in that process. Deeply involved. Myself and Senator Vickers, we had kind of an alternative route to Prop 2, yeah. which had huge problems. And between our route and Prop 2, there, there was created a compromise, which I think has been very effective. In fact, just recently I visited a pharmacy. Can I plug their name here? Yeah. Beehive Pharmacy. Those guys do it right. Awesome. You went into their facility. You, you talk to professional pharmacists. You talk about what they do, and you're going, that's exactly the program we wanted it to be. And it is one that caters to a medical population. It was really nice to see. And then with hemp, 
I passed a bill legalizing hemp and and allowing for over the counter products if they're below a certain percentage of THC. Right. And and I think for a lot of people that's brought huge relief. I myself, I was on uh, I was on Ambien for quite a while just to get to sleep. Sure. I started taking this uh, this hemp uh, gummy. I don't need Ambien anymore. Wow. I, pff, I, wow. I get to, I sleep beautifully every night. So it's it's amazing. And I would I would want that for any family member. If I could choose between those two, I would vote that other oh, one all day long with hemp. It's not a hard choice. Yeah. In fact, uh, I'll give you the link after this. So. so as psilocybin then is getting researched and potentially comes in to be legalized, mm-hmm. uh, from your perspective, is that something that you would go and try as part of your research, or how do you view that? You know, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Yeah. Uh, if it makes sense, I'll definitely, I'm, I'm open to trying it out just to see what it is and see how it works. Um, I, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I just want to do it in a legal, medically appropriate setting. That's my criteria. And if it comes to that, I would be happy in, under those circumstances to participate. And, of course, I, I want to be involved in helping it become legal in Utah. Sure. I read this quote, and I'd love to get your your thoughts on it, but a lot of my close friends that have gone through, whether it's psilocybin or ayahuasca, their consciousness has just brought up different things that they've needed to work through or overcome, and that's why people with trauma or PTSD or different things will go in and go through this process. And I read this quote that said, psychedelics would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology or the telescope is for astronomy. Mm -hmm. And after researching and you know going on your journey and trying ayahuasca what do you think about that quote i I think it's not too far off the mark i mean it's uh it because obviously those other in fact i really like that because it it doesn't say that those other tools solve the problem but they push the boundaries immensely yeah and and i think that's what we're seeing here is if psychedelics are used properly that it can be a very effective tool in psychiatry, psychology. Okay. Kind of switching gears and getting more into the religious discussion and how that interacts with this. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of people out there that want to try this or they have real use cases, whether it's trauma, addiction, anxiety, depression, whatever, Mm -hmm. but they're scared of the judgment that's going to come along with it. Or maybe they're standing with their membership or whatever. So, being in a church leadership position and just being in a religion, mm-hmm. what's your view on how should they approach this? You know, I, I, I think my best answer to that is if you go look in the general handbook of the church now, the leadership handbook, there's a statement on there about medical cannabis. And, and, and what it says in essence is if medical cannabis is used in a medically appropriate way under a doctor's supervision, we have no problem with that. And and I think, well, okay, so let's take that. And again, my interpretation on that, not the church's, yeah. is um, if, if we can do this showing good research and make it legal and do it in a, in a medically appropriate way that follows the research, I, I really don't think the church would have a problem with that. And I don't think their membership would be in question. Yeah. So if it's done legally... And uh, I, and they can see the results. I think they'd be okay. And sometimes it takes. I think change is oftentimes good, mm-hmm. but change is hard. And so just looking at how people I knew, whether it's family or friends or whatever, just uh, viewed marijuana and coming into being legalized. I mean, there's just a lot of strong opinions. Oh yeah. I don't know if you want to call it being old school or whatever, but it just it was hard for some people to change. Yeah. And so I'm sure there's those same opinions with this. So a question I have for you is, have you experienced any judgment or any harder opinions from friends or family or people in the neighborhood or wherever, peers, politically? Um, Not really. I mean, the most I can say is there's been some kind of confusion about why would you do that? But when I walk them through my experience and tell them how I got there and what the research was that I did, uh, so far, it's been the reaction has been, oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, they may still have the reservations, but they, they at least are understanding. Yeah, and and I'm happy to stand by my experience and what I did. Yeah, 
And then, and that's a view from you doing it. What if somebody for themselves, they're like, how do I know if I should try this? If they've already tried some other things or therapy Mm -hmm. based off what you know now, how do you know if you're a good candidate to even seek this out? Well, obviously there's a lot of research that has been done and needs to be done. And and I would say that they need to go to uh, a medical professional who, or, you know, somebody with more knowledge than me. Yeah. Um, can walk them through that and determine, number one, if they don't have any underlying conditions that might prove problematic, because, I mean, there are side effects uh, to anything, and do they have uh, a a trauma or something in the past, or do they have current symptoms that are, you know, been shown to be helped by this, then I would say, well, if, if you're, if after cancer with somebody who's in the know tells you it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, go with knowledge, go with sure, research. Sure. Don't just go jump in and try it. Make sure you've at least done your homework. Yeah. But uh, if you have, I'd say you probably have a good chance of making it work for you. Is there any resources that have been really helpful to you? Documentaries, books, whatever that's really helped you? I mentioned the podcast by Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I'll just reiterate that. Um, there's a series on Netflix called How to Change Your Mind. Sure. It has a, a three episodes, as I understand it. The first one's actually LSD. Second one is psilocybin, and I forget what the third one is. I don't think I've seen that Ayahuasca is not part of that. Ayahuasca is not part. I wish it was, and maybe it will be in an upcoming. But very effective, very well done, very very well presented. And that was, for me, it was mind-changing. Just to see people who'd had these severe traumas, one of the people they had on there was a a, a woman, when she was a girl, had walked in on her mother who just committed suicide. Wow. And, and of course, that's devastating. That just wrecks your world. For sure. And uh, long story short, it took her doing a psychedelic and and reliving that experience kind of from the psychedelic platform to be able to deal with it. And, and all of a sudden, a lot of these other issues that she'd had in her life with autoimmune problems and all kinds of stuff, they went away. And and I think, wow, that's, that's huge. That's yeah. major. So anyway, I recommend that series. It's very good. One question, you've already pretty much touched on it, but Mm -hmm. I think people of the faith will say, is there a place for me to be in my faith and still participate in this? I'd say yes. Um, Take your faith with you, whatever you do. Take your faith. I took mine with me. And if they said something that didn't quite agree with what I believe, I just translated it for myself internally. Sure. Nobody in the experience asked me to change my beliefs in any way. Um, they they had different terminology for things, but it was yeah. easy enough for me to translate. And, and I would say, if you take your faith with you where you go, and you you lean on your faith and let the experience inform your faith, I think you'll be fine. Did you have any other, like just getting a little bit more specific with your? Um, with your experience in Costa Rica, Mm -hmm. I would imagine that there's other ways to experience peace and through other forms of worship. And so is there any difference in maybe ayahuasca versus experiencing those same feelings through a temple or church or? Well, I mean, I'd say yes, Um, there probably is. But at the end of the day, a feeling of peace is, I think, very genuine. Sure. Um, you know, the experience I have in the temple doesn't really equate to what I had in Costa Rica, but there's yeah. some there are some similarities. You're you know, you're in a place where love abounds and and uh you know I, I I'd be careful. I I wouldn't want to equate them closely, but uh um I, I feel like that the experience I had in, in Costa Rica was one way of, of affirming God's love for me, and and just go with that. The experiences I had in the temple are really different, but uh, you know I think the Spirit can speak to us in a number of different ways. Definitely, and I think at least one view that could potentially take place for people of different faiths is for people that are not members of those faiths. For them, it's really enlightening process of seeking a higher power or mm-hmm. maybe getting to the same conclusions that they're at through just a different way, right? Mm -hmm. People that are religious maybe have their experiences in their church, but what about people outside of that church or that religion? 
there's ways to ex- still experience um, very spiritual things. So, well, I mean, God is a God over the whole earth, right? yeah. not just one particular people. And uh, I, I would say that anybody who's trying to do good and who's trying to uh, seek connection to a higher power, I want to encourage that. Absolutely. Well, Brad, thanks so much for coming on and, and just sharing your experience and your thoughts and be able to talk back and forth. It's been so awesome. Oh, I've loved it. Thank you. This has been a great interaction, and I appreciate you inviting me on. Mm-hmm.